frequently asked questions. Internal Revenue Code Section 1031 and Section 121. The tax code has many provisions to help those that own real estate, whether they're investors or homeowners. Many of the topics covered on Asset Preservation's YouTube channel talk about Internal Revenue Code Section 1031. So this addresses tax deferral on the sale of any real property, either used in a trade or business, or held for investment when it's exchanged for other like-kind real property to be used in a trade or business or held for investment. So under Section 1031, people obtain tax deferral. So the basis in the relinquished property gets rolled over into the basis of the replacement property. So it's tax deferral, but that tax liability follows the taxpayer from one property to the next. Alternatively, there's another section of the tax code known as Internal Revenue Code Section 121. And many are much more familiar with this known as the primary residence or principal residence rules. This provides tax exclusion on the sale of a principal residence that meets certain requirements. So if that property is held and used as a residence for two years out of a five-year time period, taxpayers that are single filers can exclude gain up to 250000 or up to 500000 of gain is excluded if they're married filing jointly. So Section 121 provides tax exclusion up to the 250000 threshold for single filers or half a million dollar threshold for married couples filing uh, jointly. So exclusion under primary residence rules is actually better than tax deferral under Section 1031. Well, what we want to do in this uh, brief overview is look at several different scenarios. So Section 1031 deals with the exchange of any property held for investment or used in a business. Section 121, the primary residence or principal residence rules, deal with a scenario where a taxpayer lives in a property as their principal residence. But there are three more ways to kind of combine these two tax code sections. Split treatment transaction is when we've got one property, but a portion of the property is being rented and some of the property is being used as a residence. So we call those a split treatment transaction. There are a couple of other scenarios. A taxpayer can convert a rental property, maybe one that they did an exchange into, later on they can convert it into their principal residence. So we look at this as converting Section 1031 property and converting it into 121 property. And then finally, another alternative is where a taxpayer can convert their principal residence into a rental property. So this is an example of converting, converting from Section 10, sorry, Section 121 and converting it into 1031 property. So I already briefly hit upon the primary residence rules. This is something that's available every uh, once every two out of five years. So every two years, people can qualify for this. The taxpayer must use the property as a principal residence for two of the past five years. And really, it comes down to 24 months and a 60-month period. And then they can exclude 250000 of gain for single filers, uh, 500000 of gain for married couples filing jointly. So that's 121. Let's look at the first scenario, what we call the split treatment, where we got part of the property used as a residence, section 121, and a portion of the property held for investment, section 1031. So only the property that's used as the residence qualifies for the 121 aspect, and then the portion that's held for investment qualifies for 1031. It's really important that the taxpayer get together with their tax advisor and determine how much of the property, determine the allocation of how much of the property is really considered the personal residence under 121. And so they're gonna make an allocation of the total sales price, some to the principal residence, 121, and some to being held for investment under section 1031. Now, the portion that is allocated the residence at the closing, at the sale closing, the taxpayer can receive those proceeds directly because that's for the 121, the portion that is held as a principal residence. They can, a taxpayer can also then choose to have a qualified intermediary 
step into the transaction. So it's contacting a qualified intermediary for the investment or business portion of the property. In that scenario, that portion of the proceeds of the closing are going to go to the qualified intermediary to be held for the 1031 exchange. And there are a number of different ways the taxpayers can do a, a split treatment transaction. You know, sometimes we have taxpayers that own a large ranch or farm, maybe worth, you know, four or five million dollars with a very modest farmhouse, maybe a three, four hundred thousand dollar farmhouse. In that scenario, the farmhouse itself and maybe a little bit of the adjoining land is 121, but the rest of the farm or ranch can be held for is held for investment or business purposes and can go through a 1031 exchange. Another way to look at this, as you'll see on the next slide, would be a very simplistic example of something like a, a fourplex, a small multifamily building. It could be a fourplex, could be a duplex, it could be maybe a mother-in-law unit over a detached garage. It could be a home with maybe a dedicated walkout basement that's closed off, that's rented. So a lot of different ways to do it, but let's look at this simplistically with the fourplex. Taxpayer has three units rented, so that's 1031 property, and one unit that they live in. And let's assume that they've lived here for at least two years. Simplistically, about 25% of the sale can be allocated to the primary residence, and then the proceeds from the other three rental units in the fourplex, those proceeds can go to a, a qualified intermediary for 1031 exchange. So that's a very simplistic way to look at this. You may find in your situation, after consulting with your tax advisors, you may find that maybe a little bit more of the value could be uh, associated with the principal residence portion. If maybe you've lived in that principal residence and you've fixed it up significantly, put in new countertops, cabinets, upgraded it if it's an older building, it might be a little bit more than 25%. But again, that determination is made uh, with the taxpayer consulting with their tax advisors and looking at their specific situation. So this is a split treatment transaction. On the next slide, we're going to look at converting a rental property that was acquired in a 1031 exchange and later on down the road, converting that into a principal residence. So some key things to keep in mind. First, and this is central to any 1031 exchange, at the time of acquisition, when the replacement property is acquired in a 1031 exchange, the intent of the taxpayer must be to hold that property for either investment purposes or for use in their business. So they must have that intent with any 1031 exchange property. Um, and in a perfect world, it's always advisable that that taxpayer maybe has some sort of paper trail, documentation, correspondence to support that at the time they did the 1031 exchange, their intent was to hold that property for investment but somewhere down the road, maybe years down the road, their intent with the property changed and they now decide that they no longer want to hold it for investment or use in a business, but they want to move into it and make it a residence. With this sort of approach, there's a minimum five-year holding period after the exchange is over. And then obviously the taxpayer to qualify for Section 121 tax exclusion they have to actually live in the property for a minimum of two out of five years. Now what's interesting here is that the taxpayer does not qualify for the full Section 121 tax exclusion. So we're going to look at a ratio of the time of the total ownership of the property and then look at how much of the time the taxpayer lived in it versus how much of the time it was rented or used in a business. And so they'll get a portion of that or ratio. And what I want to do on the next slide is kind of walk through an example to kind of flush that out and give you a, a real life example. Let's assume a taxpayer does a 1031 exchange with a qualified intermediary and they go into a replacement property that's rented for three full years. Three years post exchange, the taxpayer intent with the property changes. They now decide that they want to move into that property and they want to make it their primary residence. So they move in after three years and they live in the property now for five more years. So the total ownership period is eight years, three years of rental, five years now as a residence. The taxpayer is going to be eligible then for a ratio of the Section 121 tax exclusion for the amount of time that they lived in it as a residence, principal residence, over the total ownership. So five years of the eight, they lived in it as a residence. 
Therefore, they're eligible for five-eighths of the Section 121 tax exclusion uh, when they go to sell the property. There's one more scenario that comes up, and this one's kind of an interesting one because it's really using two tax code provisions at the time of a sale. So this would be converting a residence where somebody has lived in a property, converting it into a rental, and then taking advantage of a 1031 exchange. And as you'll see on the slide, Revenue Procedure 2005-14 provides some guidance on how to combine both of these tax code provisions at the same time. So first off, as in any Section 121 transaction, the taxpayer must have lived in the property for two of the past five years, therefore to meet the requirements of Section 121. Now they move out of their residence and they make it a rental property, so it's rented. They then, at the time of sale, provide it's held for rental purpose and they live there for two out of the past five years. They can exclude some of the game, so 250,000 filing single, 500,000 married filing jointly, because they lived in it two out of the past five years. And then the difference, the remainder, is set up and goes to a qualified intermediary in a 1031 exchange. So the taxpayer acquires a replacement property held for investment but they don't have to acquire as much as their sales price because they can exclude either that uh, $250,000 or $500,000, depending upon whether they're single or married. And then they buy a replacement property in a 1031 exchange. To review your specific 1031 exchange situation, contact Asset Preservations Headquarters in California at 800-282-1031 or our Eastern Regional Office in New York at 866-394-1031. Please read the full disclaimer as asset preservation cannot provide tax or legal advice. A proper evaluation of the benefits and risks associated with a particular transaction or tax return position often requires advice from a competent tax and or legal advisor familiar with your specific transaction, objectives, and the relevant facts.